The Times this morning says Ghana tops FDI in West Africa due to prudent economic management. The president uh, talking there and rights president appeals for calm in Cherponi. Uh, we'll talk about that story uh, later on. The finder, NIA, were told that 1.2 million registered Accra East mass uh, registration starts June 4. Uh, 198 billion cities public debt is 57.5% of GDP. That's on the front page of the finder and traditional council assures of incident free homo war. That's the Ga traditional council. The daily graphic new companies act game changer. It will eliminate shady ownership deals. That's uh, the uh, uh, the act. Mr. Otin uh, who is managing director of uh, Tropical Cable and Conductor Limited, suggesting that it will eliminate city deals. And then MOFA suspends export of selected vegetables. Uh, it's a, a headache here. Some uh, exports, were told, uh, have been sus suspended. And government makes headway in USA visa restrictions. Uh, the BNFT says that $40 million lost. Uh, to oil palm smuggling annually. Uh, a lot of oil palm being smuggled. That's the story on the BNFT. Uh, Daily Guide says Rawlings floors Africa Watch in court. NPP will beat NDC with positive record uh, attributed to uh, Samir Wuku and we won't compromise fiscal discipline. Those are some of the stories on the guide this morning. My guest to do the talking, uh, a member of the NPP, Steve Eric Chum is with, here, with me here this morning. Eric, good morning. Good morning. Hope your That's weekend was fantastic. I'm good. Uh, yes, uh, mm. it was good. It was great. You had a fantastic weekend. You great. I'm, I'm good too. And then member of parliament for Daklu constituency, a member of the NDC, Honorable uh, Kwame Agroja is here. Good morning. Hope good you're morning. doing great. Uh, yeah, good, uh, and great. Uh, the funeral, how did it go? Yes, uh, well, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you in mm -hmm. the media. And I want to thank especially the former President Rawlings, mm -hmm. uh, who came to uh, pay the last respect to Honorable Steve Akoli, uh, the General Secretary, Asedun Peter, who led the party, Honorable Kabo, who led the uh, government delegation, uh, former MPs, mm. uh, and then the uh, speakers, uh, honorable, right honorable speakers, rep, who also came uh, there through uh, honorable Jetro, and uh, many, many well wishes who came uh, to uh, mourn with us to bury uh, honorable Steve Akoli on Saturday. We are very appreciative of all your support, and uh, we pray that God uh, replenish whatever time and resources you spent on this. I thank everybody. Great, and uh, sure. Daklu really saw a huge crowd over the weekend. Yeah. Now, let's start with um, the NIA issues. Uh, some more complaints from people who are registering, but uh, the authority continues to assure people that all will be done to ensure that no one is left behind. Now, we're told that so far, uh, close to 1.2 million uh, have been registered since it started. Uh, 630,000 plus females, 561,000 uh, plus males. Um, this is the Accra West, uh, which ended last Saturday, uh, has so far captured 609,761 Ghanaians. Uh, that's the uh, story so far. Now, the authority is suggesting or explaining that Residents who are unable to register during the mass exercise in the Accra West will be, will be able to do so at the district and regional offices to be set up by the NIA after the mass registration exercise. Uh, Mr. Pamdeti, who speaks for the authority, uh, has mentioned that um, uh, the collection point, that's those who have taken the cards and are to collect them, uh, will be located at, he said, Gan South, Botiano, English, Yamanfro, Gan West, Weja, Bawe, Domia Braubum, Gan Central, Anya, Sotum, Gan West, Trouble, Amasaman, Gan North, Okankwe South, and then Okankwe Central. So uh, if you have and yet to collect your card, these are places that you can. Uh, he also added that some of the challenges include sleeping overnight at the centers to make it possible for registrants to be captured on time when the process starts at 7. In addition, many had to wait in long queues. Some people said they had to wait three and seven days to get their cards, while others claimed that even though they had met all the requirements and gone through the process, their card uh, was not issued. So, uh, so far, so good. But the complaints seem to be coming in. Eric, um, it, how should the authority ensure that 
it, people who want to be captured do not necessarily have to struggle to get this done. The, there seem to be too many complaints around these centers. Well, um, good morning once mm. again to you and then to my honorable friend here and also to all the viewers of TV3 this morning. Uh, when it comes to these things, uh, I feel that we always have to look at it from a bigger uh, perspective. We've been trying to do national identification for a very long time. I think that if I'm not as a Drayton, this is the very first time that this huge numbers of people have actually been registered and even been given the cards. Mm. Uh, so if you look at it from the time of uh, President Kufour to date, uh, successive governments have tried to do the national ID card um, and it hasn't gotten to this point where we've had these numbers being able to register. Well, when people complain, I think that there's always a justification in the fact that they would expect that the processes would be uh, smoother and they would not spend too much time mm. uh, registering. But then you also have to factor in the fact that because they're doing it in, uh, in phases and in different places, there's always a tendency that people would troop to the uh, registration centers uh, in a quest to uh, also register. And then the issues of queuing becomes inevitable. I think that there's also a process where uh, the applicants can actually fill up the form online uh, and for that matter makes the process a bit easier. You would always have challenges with these things, but I think that uh, we need to still persevere. The good thing is that, as the authority is saying, after the mass registration exercise, district and regional offices will be open mm. so that people can go in as and when they have the time to be able to register. <coughs> so complaints, of course, needs to be dealt with so that uh, the things that can be ironed out and uh, avoided are avoided. But the issues to do it, how long you stay in the queue and the process itself and everything, is things that unfortunately we'd have to bear with just because of the fact that... We couldn't have done anything about it. No, because you see, you, you, there's always a, a chicken and egg situation. You could decide that you can even open a lot more uh, touch points where people mm. can go and register. But then you come, it comes to the issue to do with costs and capacity and personnel. So there's always a, a trade-off conversation that you can have. So you can even decide that every, uh, you can even make it akin to what happens during elections where you have a, a center in each polling station or electoral area, for instance. But that has cost implications, resource implications, uh, logistical implications. So for me, I think that it's a, it's a start. Uh, it will get to a point where majority of the 30 million people will be registered. Then the process itself would go into, will slow down, where there will be a more organic uh, registration where people who turn, I think 16 or so, would go on and, and register. And then, of course, once that is merged with our births and deaths uh, registry, then this whole idea that you have to get a certain age before you go and register it would be a thing of the past. What would happen is that immediately a child is born, they go into uh, registration, they find their way into a database, and that's it. I mean, my brother here and I had an opportunity to live uh, in the UK for a while. Nobody actually even ever goes to vote with a voter's registration card. Your, it's your date of birth, which is actually captured in, uh, with your address where you live which is captured in a database. You go there, they do uh, a cross-checking to see that, yes, you are the person. Sometimes people don't even go with an ID. Once you go, you mention your name and you're, you're, you're allowed to vote. So this is the 21st century. The technology abounds. Mm. But because we find ourselves here because we essentially haven't done this, there's no real robust database for us to be able to identify Ghanaians and non ghanaians so unfortunately we had to go through this process of registering everybody which would essentially have 
some bottlenecks and teething problems. But I feel that, I mean, even if you look at the numbers that have been able to be registered so far, million. that is probably the largest number of people that have been registered ever since we, uh, we came up with the idea that we wanted to do a national identification card. Um, I believe that authority is doing well. Hmm. Sometimes the uh, education and the communication aspect is also key so that even people who uh, feel that once the process uh, is finished, they will not get an opportunity, might now feel that, well, if I am busy today, uh, I would wait till after the process and go to the district office or regional office to have my, uh, my registration done. Um, but, of course, like I said, when people make complaints, it behoves on the authority to interrogate to deal with the, it. Yeah, to integrate, uh, these uh, complaints and deal with it, um, investigate and deal with it so that uh, some of the issues to do with the process itself will not be... Mm. Uh, okay. Yeah. Eric, I'm grateful. Uh, Kwame, I mean, like Eric is suggesting, I mean, the, the authorities keep assuring that we'll, we'll resolve these challenges. And yet, day in and day out, we see these challenges. Now, these challenges that we are seeing in Accra West could easily get repeated when they start at Accra East. Perhaps we have decided that there should be challenges. Is that why we're going through these challenges? Well, I, I doubt if, if any... any body would say deliberately let's go and uh, uh, create challenges because I don't know what who would benefit from that. I, I largely agree with uh, uh, my colleague here about the principles. Uh, you remember many times I came here and said for instance when we keep doling out huge millions of dollars to conduct election and after every four years we do it again claiming that we, we are just trying to make the, the vote secure. When I said that we are wasting that money because mm -hmm. in advanced societies, to, to today, myself and my colleague can vote uh, in, in the UK because we, 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 we resident, uh, we call common of citizens when you are legally there. Mm -hmm. But it's so the, the cost of elections in, in UK, mm -hmm. maybe somebody needs to work it out and see whether it's probably not cheaper than, than what, what we do here. So we go through the process of claiming we want to practice democracy, and by the time we finish, there's no money left in the kitty to do any development. <laughs> so the democracy, the voting itself, becomes what we, we pride ourselves in as, as, as development. Mm -hmm. But that, that shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, the, the, I also agree with him when he says that it's a high time. Government in the past uh, had a bite at uh, trying to get us uh, a reasonably protected database of who is here, whether as a, as a, a citizen or as a, a resident mm. uh, uh, alien or something like that. We, need, we needed to know. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, government in the past, rightly, he said, President uh, Kufo, uh, down through President Mills, and everybody have had uh, an opportunity to do something. And it got to a point now that we said, look, let's, let's do it holistically mm. and, and do everything, which there's, there's nothing wrong about it. Some of us had issues with sections of the law that is guiding us to do this. Some of us are of the view that irrespective of who was in parliament or which executive brought this, there's a flaw. And that must be addressed. For me, that is the most important issue for me that makes me unable to be, to be totally supportive of this. Because I keep saying, if Article 42 says that it's only Ghanaians that can vote, it means that my auntie in the village who has, never got, who has no interest in traveling abroad, so doesn't need a, a, a passport, mm. hasn't have any interest or, or of buying a car, or doesn't have a car, doesn't, hasn't got a, a driving license, the only form of a secure, uh, by the way, our voter's ID card is more secure than our passport. Because the process of getting a voter's ID card is much more rigorous. If I want to get a passport, it's between me and the passport office. If I want to get a voter's ID card, I have to go through a registration, exhibition, and other things. So our voter's ID card is, in actual fact, more secure than the passport we have. But strangely, the law, the law we passed made it as if it is illegal or the voter's ID card is not good enough. But I, keep, I, I see, I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I still believe Article 42 confirms that if you have a voter's ID card, that is a form of national ID. Mm -hmm. Going forward, there are other things that are required today. If you were to go to Adaklu, 
And you say that we should generate, uh, how do you call it, uh, 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 an address, the digital address. For God's sake, a vast majority of my community doesn't have telephone connectivity. So how are we supposed to generate that? So is the EC going to allow us to use one person's address, which whenever they find it, mm. for all of us to register? These are the uh, per pertinent questions we should, we should answer. But guess what? Nobody's bothered. Nobody's answering this question. Are people going to be allowed to register? And in, in any case, there's evidence that people are registering with multiple addresses. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, multiple people are, uh, are registering with single address because they just can't generate the, the, the how do you call the it? The DPS. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It just doesn't exist in, in, in much of my community. Thirdly, there's this issue about people caught with this equipment for registration in private hands. There's this talk about uh, the equipment being sent to a particular church for people to register. The uh, NIA is yet to tell us whether they have started working on the basis that a church or a community can decide that, come and register us so you can send the, the, them the equipment. Is that the case that maybe EP Church or uh, Catholic Church can say that despite your own uh, uh, roadmap of registration, we want you to bring us somebody or give us some equipment. All these things are shouted. And, and also, the political rhetorics, right from the head of the NIA, Professor Atifa, at a point in time, when he at, uh, attempted talking as if he was taking over the job of the EC, suggesting that this was going to be the basis of, 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 of uh, voters' Uh, 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 registration, mm. which is which the law doesn't even allow. We, we, he can't take over the job of the of the uh, of the electoral commission, and all these things gave a certain mindset that the process is being just bulldozed through, irrespective of the, the challenges for a political end. But guess what? This, when done well, would outlive political parties. If we do it well and the data base is secure, the benefits are immense. So that is why we needed to extricate ourselves from the, the, the temptation of, of making it look like it's a political thing because a national a database cannot be to the advantage of any political party or the, or the other. So it is important for government to set the record straight on these things, that EC's job will be different, the uh, 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 NIA's job will be different, and the, the queries people raise about people, individuals registering, allegedly registering, churches registering, and other things, are explained to the people so that we know that it is not a case that government is deliberately engaged in registration. There are, there are rumors of, of uh, 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 in some districts, birth certificates being manufactured in, in the biblical proportions for certain groups of people. Are these things true? Because I know that it's not that easy to get a birth certificate, but people talk about this. And so the government needs to take time or the, uh, uh, to... Uh, get, uh, deal with this, and so that we all know that this is a national project, and like he's saying, we need it. Mm. I feel it is a better way of knowing how many people will turn 18 next year if that, that database exists. It's good for government's own planning. It's good for planning for schools. When when you know the ages, then you know how many people may likely be uh, needing university spaces, how many people may be needing jobs, and all, all, all other things. So we need a database. But so far, government have created a bit of cloud around the whole thing. And you notice this, the, the, the debate in parliament, even about the cost, 1.2 billion. And we ask ourselves, India, 1.2 million a billion people, how much exactly did they spend to do this? India have the same, and uh, China have the same thing. How many, 1.3 billion people, how much did, have they spent in doing this? Why should Ghana spend 1.2 billion? We're told it's a PPP. How much is the PPP partner bringing? How much is government uh, bringing? And I think that when we get back to parliament, we need to begin to tease out questions that will begin to bring answers as to what exact inv investments are going into this. For the numbers, 1.2 million registered so far. Uh, it, it, we could have done more, but uh, sometimes maybe when we are able to clear the, the teething problems, maybe it, it gives an opportunity for, mm. uh, uh, I mean, a bigger dose of registration in the, in the future. For me, the day it's cleared, if, if you were to tell me today Article 42 cannot be interpreted in a political interest, I will be, the, I will be an ambassador of this. But, but today, I know that if you were to go to Adakru to register, the only form, the largest form of identity, and much more secure than a passport, 
in hands of the majority of my people will be voters' ID card. If you deny them the right to use this for me, then you don't have them attacked. Then you are deliberately asking them not to register. Don't tell them that they should bring somebody along. I have got my voter's ID card, which is more secure than a passport. Why should I go and bring somebody to come and represent me? Okay, grateful. Let's move to the final this morning. Uh, there's a story here. 198 billion CD public debt is 57.5% of GDP. Now, a summary of economic and financial data published by the Bank of Ghana puts the country's total public debt at 198 billion as at the end of March 2019. Um, while the nominal debt figure continues to rise when measured as a percentage of uh, GDP the debt is 57.5 percent of GDP um, uh, the finance minister uh, says that we're spending close to 55 percent of tax revenue to service interest on loans alone and uh, uh, on the other side we're told that in case the economy does not expand to accommodate these uh, rising debts, it could impact negatively on the country's debt to GDP ratio, which currently stands as 57.5%. Uh, domestic revenue collection has seen a significant rise, though. That's what we're saying, about 11% rise. And some people are worried about how the rating agencies would interpret these numbers and the possible impact on Ghana in terms of the cost of credit. And should, we, should we be so much worried about our, our, our debt rising? Well, I mean, I think that you, what you've read mm. uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of contextualized the conversation. Um, so you're looking at the overall uh, public debt. Mm. You're also looking at even our internal revenue mobilization going up. Uh, there's another story that you read which uh, pointed to the fact that uh, FDI has increased and in actually in the sub In West Africa. Um, Ghana is the, uh, the, the top destination for uh, foreign di direct investment. So that's, that's, that's where we have to take it from. Right? And you also have to probably even go drill down to uh, exactly what these numbers are in terms of one, what the monies are being used for, and the fact that <clears throat> we had to find a way of restructuring the debt stock that we had over a period because of the challenges that we had with uh, going to the IMF and all sorts of things. The good thing for me is the fact that uh, because of the rebasing of the uh, economy, we have a situation where uh, what most economies use as an indicator if an, uh, your, your debt is too high uh, points to the fact that the debt to GDP ratio is hovering around 55 percent or so. Uh, what it means is that we still have some fiscal space to be able to borrow, and the word is advisedly, borrow wisely mm. to be able to support. Uh, the work of government and also bringing uh, the necessary support and infrastructure for the ordinary people. Uh, so for me, I think that um, if you look at it from a bigger perspective as well, and all the indications point to an economy that's on the right trajectory. Um, you see, when we have this conversation surrounding the economy, it's almost difficult to not become a bit historical in terms of where we have come from. We've come from a situation where uh, we had to necessarily go through an IMF bailout. Uh, that pointed to the fact that the economy had been run aground um, and we essentially had to go to the IMF for a bailout. Now, over the period, within the last five, six years, uh, it was even impossible for us to be even able to meet the requirements for us to exit until this government came into into office to be able to do all it can to be able to exit the IMF uh, 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 conditions that had been set. Now, you look at all of these things and you, it points to the fact that when you have a government had come in two and a half years and has been able to exit the IMF and has been able to grow 
the uh, agriculture sector, has been able to uh, execute a free SHS program, has been able to clear the debt of the National Health Authority, which was hanging on the sector, has been able to bring back the uh, teacher training allowance and nursing training allowance, has been able to offer 100,000 young people who in, hitherto didn't have an opportunity to, to find work, to work under NAPCO and all the fantastic things that's happening at Maslock and all of those things. NEIP, um, what we have done with the uh, Sino-Hydro um, butter agreement where we'll be able to use our bauxite to support our uh, infrastructure drive. That points to an economy and a government that is being run prudently and an economy that is on the right trajectory. Now, when people complain or have issues with the fact that maybe in their personal day-to-day -day, uh, lives uh, they are going through hard times and they, there's some hardship. I mean, it's not in my place to come and disagree with them. Mm. But if you look at all the things that are pointed out, planting for food and jobs and all of those things, it points to a government that is switched on and is putting things in place to make sure that the ordinary Ghanaian benefits. But if individuals have issues, or their issues, complaints, when it comes to either road infrastructure, uh, I didn't even mention what's going on in the railway sector, for instance, and people say that, well, I'm going through a hard time. It's still government's responsibility to make sure that those people are uh, uh, OK. I mean, if people are clamoring for water, for instance, or better schools, mm -hmm. or even better uh, wages and salaries and all that. Those are all justified things that citizens everywhere in the world are meant to ask for. But if we want to be candid with ourselves in looking at where we have come from mm -hmm. and the kind of work that this government has done in the last two and a half years, I believe strongly that we're on the right path. Um, of course, like they will always say, uh, there's more work to be done. Uh, we need to be able to uh, meet all the various uh, manifesto promises that we did. The 1D1F is, is, in, 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 um, is in full swing. People keep claiming that they don't even know where the factories are, but every single day new factories are being commissioned. So that is where we are. But I feel that on the whole, even the whole idea that uh, uh, internal lead generated revenue for mm. instance mobilization thing has gone up points to an economy that even with the right support and the, the, the stimul stimuli will be able to push we'll forward. Get there. Let, let me quickly uh, chip in this before I move to Kwame. What is the reason why these um, indicators are pointing uh, as you suggested at the right direction and yet the, the complaint that the economy is harsh, is it a matter of time or these are very fantastic indicators and yet people do not feel that they, they, they are, their lives have improved? You see, there's, there's, a, there's economics and there's politics. Mm. You know, so, I mean, the basic economics that I know, which points to specific indicators that would either suggest an economy is doing well or not, is that it hasn't changed. Mm. Um, but like we say, people have, we have local economies, we have personal economic mm. um, factors and things that affect people. <clears throat> but because for the purposes of this particular conversation where we are basically going to uh, look at the performance of agriculture, for instance, of industry, of uh, health sector, uh, and all of those things, uh, amount of jobs that have been created, mm. the support that goes to, let's say, for instance, business people, private sector, entrepreneurs, and all of those things. Now, there's no reason why anybody that has 3,500 young <coughs> entrepreneurs who have benefited from NEIP, for instance, will say that their economic conditions had become worse because they didn't have the opportunity to start with. Mm. There's no reason why a mother uh, who was basically uh, selling tomatoes or whatever fish by the roadside who hitherto couldn't afford to take their child to 
uh, secondary school now has an opportunity to take their child to say that their conditions have become worse. Mm -hmm. But like there are still people who, for one reason or the other, are still living in poverty. People who are impoverished because of one Your reason. Your life has not seen See, improvement. Yes. And I'm saying that, and I cannot sit here and suggest that it is not government's responsibility to make sure that in terms of social mobility and in terms of making sure that the right uh, economic uh, things are put in place to make sure that the average Ghanaian is, is, is better off than before. Even issues to do with utilities and all of those things, these are conversations that we can have. But when we are doing the politics different, then where you can now come in and say, well, we did much better and all of those things. But you see, the good thing is that the people themselves mm. would get an opportunity to subject both political parties that have just been in power in the last 25 years or so to the effects of the stewardship and how we have governed and all of those things. So sometimes I really do not necessarily panic too much because I feel that it's, it's the opportunity for the people to look at the facts on the ground. I mean, we had a situation where uh, health facilities that were uh, working with the NHI were going on strike every day and mm -hmm. were threatening not to take it. It's not happening today. We had issues with uh, young people, now close to almost 180,000 young people who have had an opportunity to go to secondary school. Here that they didn't get opportunity. Nursing training allowance was cancelled. Teacher training allowance was cancelled. There's a lot of uh, work that has gone in in the planting for food and, and jobs uh, and farmers are happy. We have had uh, an increase in the production of maize in uh, cassava, plantain and all of this. And we have actually gone to the point of exporting some of these things. So these are real things, tangible things that you can, you can touch. What mm. is going on in the railway sector, for instance? What uh, Sino Hydro is bringing in? The 1D1F factories have already been commissioned. People are working there. So on the whole, it points to a certain trajectory. And as, I mean, and the numbers do not appear in a vacuum. It okay. appears because there are specific things that are happening within the economy. You've had some critics saying that, well, some of the, uh, the gains that we've made is as a result of what is happening in the oil and gas sector. Fine, but even if you strip that off, and you look at it from, and I'm not even being political here, you look at it from uh, since 1992 till date, it points to a country that we've made progress. Of course, people would say that we could have done much better than we, we have done today vis-a-vis mm. uh, -vis what other countries have done or even looking at the potential that we have as a country. But I believe strongly that you're on the right course. Okay, grateful. Kwame, so uh, this is where we are. Our debt is 198 billion cities, 57.5% uh, of GDP. Yeah, I mean, he, he says that we should not be worried about it. Right. You know, this argument is uh, not a new one. Um, we know how we arrived at that figure. Mm. It's simply an academic exercise conducted by the statistical service uh, and over a period of time, uh, interestingly, in the past, this government didn't believe the data from uh, statistical service. Uh, Dr. Baumia uh, infamously uh, uh, queried the training drivers in safe ways of maneuvering around portals. You know, the reason I say this is that Whilst you look at the figures in terms of investment in new road project and uh, rehabilitation or maintenance keeps dwindling, the state of accidents on the road, the condition on the, the real condition on the roads, are deteriorating. So it would be a good idea for DLA to start training drivers to deal with what the reality will be for uh, quite some time. We have a situation where, because it is allowed Government rebases the economy. Mm. Government does not rebase the economy. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an exercise that happens over a period. Government agency. Yeah, but okay. It's, 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 okay. Today, Today, you see, you see, <laughs> we are talking about FDI. Mm. He's happy to own it for government. 
the data we are talking about uh, how do you call it the the the, the debt how we arrive at the, the debt to gdp mm. he is claiming that government did well that is why it is low but he is claiming that it is not government that no, but when you say that, that government did, rebases, that did the rebasing, okay, no, but okay. that's just, oh, that's not okay, okay. Yeah. Eric, you a government mm -hmm. agency did a uh, rebasing, so it is as if you had two CDs in your pocket before you went to bed. You woke up and then they are telling you that your two CDs is equal to four CDs or something because the economy has been rebased. So no, but that's not automatically that's we have more money. No, but your no. two CDs in your pocket is still your two CDs. Somebody academically. Or it's done. I'm not saying it's only done under the NPP. Academically, they are telling you that we are richer. But in your pocket, the two CDs you went to bed with is still the two CDs you have. Your, your leaky school building is still the leaky school building you had when you, you, went, you went to bed. So this fixation on the fact that the economy has grown so much. And today, if we were to go back and say that we didn't rebase this economy, you see where the debt would have been. The qu question is, has the rebasing added value to me, to you? Mm. Has the, does the rebasing mean that the road leading to your village is now better overnight? Does that mean that the poor farmer gets better value for his crop? Does that mean that when you go to the hospital, you get a better medical care? All these answers are no. So when you see growth in theory without any development in reality, we should be worried as a people, not as MPP or NDC. Mm. My brother talked about, he, he, linked it, he linked it to FDI. As a matter of fact, this is not the highest group, growth Ghana has probably ever had. In terms of, With, uh, uh, in terms FDI of FDI. Even in, if, if in 2015, I think we did 3.2 billion. 2015. So you made 3.3 billion in, 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 in 2019. You added 100 million. 100 million. I'm, I'm sure we've invested so much before. When E and I alone probably brought in seven billion dollars. Out of that seven billion dollars and that NDC, today we have doubled our oil production, oil and gas production. What does that mean? More money, as finance minister confirmed in parliament, it is equal to an average of one billion dollars a year. To the treasury so when we are talking about these hypothetical figures let's juxtapose that with what actually happened so 2015 we can do 3.2 so if we do it 3.3 in in 2019 in fact it's a mediocre growth no but the only I mean, thing I, I the, the, the yeah, only thing is that eric i get a chance on, to react the, the only thing we are told that the fdi for nigeria and co have dwindled then much of the fdi in this a big uh, uh, growth areas is into oil and oil and gas. It's only in, in maybe on Africa wide, maybe Egypt and Kogu does a bit more of agri agro processing and, and 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 other things. So the point we are we are we are making here is that the finance minister has been consistent in selling the fact that the debt to GDP is fifty something percent simply because of growth, not because it's added anything. Today I ask this question. When you say you, your, your debt to GDP is better, and you said you have added 11% to, uh, to domestic revenue, to, to mest, domestic revenue, how does that translate into things that matter to the people of this country? Do I have my roads being fixed? Do I have do we have the gutters in Accra being fixed? Do we have can we see better airports being built, better schools being built? better, you, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, hospitals and everything being built, have we seen a corresponding better jobs income as it used to be today out of what we did with the, the kind of uh, FDR and uh, uh, how do you call it, economic management today, NPP can easily hire more people to go and work, for instance, at the Gapoha Hospital, which we built, which uh, we, it was built under the NDC, which we didn't recruit one person. So they have opportunity to fight over who managed that hospital. They might have the opportunity to go and fight over who, man, who manages, uh, 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 how do you call it, Terminal 3 at Kotoka International Airport. The question is, what does this figure the finance minister is talking about in FDI and in, uh, in debt to GDP mean to me as a, bus uh, as a businessman? Who, which, which contractor watching us today is clapping because the GDP has, uh, uh, has 
uh, uh, debt to GDP is improved. Does that mean that the contractor's debt to NID and other things have been, uh, will be paid off? None, none. You understand? Does that mean that the, 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 the textile uh, 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 manufacturer is better off because half of this has been cancelled out by the exchange rate uh, losses anyway? So I am saying, when he talked about uh, Sino Hydro, as a matter of fact, I am not aware that Sino Hydro has disbursed $1 to do any road. By the way, the outstanding issue of that Sino Hydro uh, agreement, the, 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 the minister was challenging me in parliament. And I say that I want to see all the value for money report. In fact, they should just publish it of that project because I dare them. And this is direct. There's no way government can prove to me that they have gone to do site survey, soil test on 441 kilometers of road across this country because that is a necessary ingredient for value for money. So all those people who have run to claim that they have done value for money for this project, I'm saying you have to prove to me that you have done soil tests and everything for 441 kilometers because it could, it could be the only basis for which you know that when you start working on a section of road, you are not going to meet a section that you need to scoop out and replace with a stable material. So when we are talking about Sino Hydro, I'll be the first to, to say that we need it. We need the, to fix the roads. But Sino Hydro is not yet, it's not yet a panacea. In any case, $500 million is not a solution to Ghana's road net, uh, network. Even we were able to increase uh, even just taxes on fuel. Move it a uh, road, uh, road fund from two, uh, two, uh, 220 million to 1.2 billion. All that has happened so far uh, under NDC was we, we leveraged on it, took some loans. These people did nothing about it. After we, we should have pay, finished paying the loan in 2018, they've just gone to borrow extra. So no new, nothing, uh, nothing new is coming. And I'm saying that if you look at the investment we did in oil and gas, and, it, and other that today we have a gas processing plant. We have uh, 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 doubled our, 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 our revenue, bringing more money into this economy. That there's evidence that we have invested a lot, even with the mega uh, resources we had in healthcare, in road, and other things that are evident today. Where are the asphaltic overlays going around Accra that we used to see in 2015, 2016? In other, even other regions and other districts, where are the, uh, the contractors on our roads working everywhere? Not only in NPP strongholds, because there's evidence. That all those road mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. awarded under NDC mm -hmm. that they claimed they were they were they, they were they were doing, including the ones right, in Adaku, right, right. have been stopped. Right, right. And except the ones in NPP stronghold, they are continue, the contractors are continuing because selective people. So I'm saying that we have done better. So we are not Ghanaians are not going to buy these cosmetic things that the the, 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 the finance minister would be because the two CDs in my pocket a night before the announcement. Of of the redesign mm. remain the two cities. So, so Ghana may uh, cosmetically or academically appear to be our 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 the volume of our our in reality without development. And it's not about NDC or NPP. If we continue like that, the only hope we'll give to Ghanaian youth is NAPCO. And I say, if any government sees NAPCO, as the only hope they can give the, the, the youth, that is a very mediocre thinking. This was the what fact that the, 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 right, right, the right, hope, right, right, hold on, the hope you need to give people is that you have built Terminal 3. So somebody gets a proper job, a proper job which is sustainable. When there's a growth in domestic airline, Ghanaian, more Ghanaians are trained as pilots and other things. When Kumasi Airport gets finished, and I thank them, of course, they came to take the last part of the uh, loan to do that. I have to give them that credit. But Tamale Airport is still outstanding. When those things get completed, people get real jobs. So when a teacher trains and is qualified, and you say you are not qualified to go and teach, but come and join NAPCO, so that you get 700 instead of 1,007, that can only be mediocre. And that cannot be a vision of a government that wants to see the citizens have a better life. NAPCO is not a better life. It's like saying, take it or leave it. I have no solution to your unemployment problem. All I can do for you is take these 700 uh, uh, cities if you like. If you like, you can stay at home. And I don't think that is a hope that a government can give to the youth. In the okay, country. let me get right to right. that briefly. See, and I think back. that uh, I started off this conversation with the fact that we had come from somewhere. You see, now to start with, I, if I was a, a graduate who had stayed at home for five years as a result of the 
mismanagement and incompetent way that you manage that economy. And because of that, you took us to the IMF. And that was part of the conditionalities that uh, there should be a freeze on public sector employment. And then I see you sitting on this platform saying that the government that actually had come in, and at the time when NAPCO um, was actually implemented, we're still um, under the IMF's uh, bailout uh, conditions. And we had to find a way of making sure that at least young people will not lose hope. They will not feel that government was not interested in whatever that they were going through, but would put a measure in place to at least usher them into the job scene. That's what has happened. Now, um, like I said, if you indicate that for one reason or the other you're going through some challenges, I'm not here to argue with you, but it points to also the, the fact that this is a government that over the period has done all of these things that I have listed. It's, it's a fact. We were in this country where facilities that were working under the national health insurance would be threatening to go on strike or would stop accepting the cards. Pharmacies uh, working with the NHI were threatening to stop accepting it. Mm. Uh, teacher training uh, allowance was stopped. Uh, nursing training allowance was stopped. They stopped even the um, the research allowance that was going to uh, the academic staff in the various universities. It was a huge conversation in this country. They, we had issues at a point, agriculture was growing at a negative. We had four years, we had to grapple with Dumso under your watch for four years. So for me, I feel that that elections in 2016, the 7th December 2016, was a clear manifestation of the sort of stewardship that you had uh, put on the Ghanaian people. And they told you that, listen, the, the way you govern this country and the manner in which you have actually made us suffer is the reason why we are voting you out. When, even up till date, they've not even showed us the Kwesibotri report because they go about telling everybody that the MPP lied to Ghanaians when the Ghanaian people were actually living under your stewardship and they know the sort of uh, challenges that we're facing. One okay. D1F, it's working. Last time the Minister of Trade, I think some of your reporters were... Is that 57 uh, of yeah, them are working? So, yeah, some of your reporters were there. I believe strongly that, I mean, this is of public record. If it's a lie, it, 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 it can be ask you found this. out. Sh sh and shouldn't all the, the minister uh, be able to tell us that this 57 have employed a, a certain Oh, yes, that, you, yeah, but that, that can be done. It is not okay. a... Uh, but the thing is, that once they are up and running, people are employed. Mm. You see, we... we, we and I always expect the media, for instance, to be the uh, referee when it comes to our conversations. Because, you see, when I start talking, it's almost as if that's what you guys call the equalization. The NDC had been in power from 2009 to about 2014, there about when President Mahama came to tell the whole country that the meat has been eaten to the bone, and that the economy was on its last legs. Now, they even decided that instead of telling us that we are we're really in trouble and we're going to go to the IMF, came out and told us that we're going to do some, going to the IMF for some policy credibility. And they went to uh, Pedrasi at the time, and there was some economic forum that happened in Senchi and everything. It ended up that we're going to the IMF for a bailout and all the attendant challenges that we had to deal with. And this government had to be show conviction, discipline, in terms of the fiscal discipline and all of those things, to fiscal be able to discipline. exit the IMF. Mm. When we start talking about issues to do with doom so and everything, we also forget that when the NDC took power in 2009, 7 January 2009, there was no doom so in this country. We started experiencing the doom so phenomenon which has become, by the way, part of the uh, global uh, lexicon that is uh, associated with Ghana. In 2012, almost four years after taking over office, then you take us through another three and a half years, almost four years of doing so. And then you go back and you are happy.
to be beating your chest that you solve something. I mean, come on. I mean, that you should give us, you should spare us some of these things. It was not now, resolved. Now, you see, even the so-called emergency uh, power, uh, 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 emergency power and generators that they brought took like three, four years before it came in. Car power and a Mary were essentially. Hey, what is my, your point? I'm hitting the, the, the top point, of the hour. The, the point is so that the point, the, the point I am making is that mm -hmm. you see, your stewardship. The way you govern this country, the management of the economy mm. in almost every single sector, and that is there, maybe we don't have enough time, mm. but every single indicator mm -hmm. from 2009, I'll show, I'll show 7 January to date, even in just this last two and a half years, is much better than yours. Okay. Okay. Even the things that they're talking about, yeah. talking about okay. exchange rate, for instance, even the rate of depreciation <laughs> of the CD mm. is. Right. Much lower than we right. pertain right. under the okay. NDC. Right. This, this is so it's very clear yeah. that yeah. Let, let, the NDC really right. do right. not have anything to offer okay. the people is, of this okay. country. This, this is a mere rhetoric. This is a okay. of tell us, record. You should tell I, us about the kind I will of tell you. Is it challenges that you put this people This is This is a matter of public In the near future, which is the next 20, 30 years. By the end of 2016, Ghana's debt was $120 billion. As of today, 198 billion, 78 billion added in two years. And this is the, the party that is talking about prior prudence. When you take uh, uh, for, for 2016, by the, the current rebasing of the finance minister himself, mm. you know what debt to GDP would have been in 2016? 55. It means that NDC debt to GDP, even in 2016, is better than what the finance minister is selling me in a very mediocre form today. That is a matter of public record. Debt to GDP in 2016, according to this uh, the rebasing, would have been 55. It's better than the, what they have today. And I'm saying that under what we did, we, 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 we sent more portable, portable water to more people. We built more roads, more schools. In fact, we created more jobs for the NPP to come and fill. And that's why I cited schools <laughs> we built, the e-blocks the e that they have recruited teachers, the Gapoa Hospital, for instance, that they have recruited the staff. Airport, the Terminal 3, and a host of them. And I'm saying that these are sustainable, checkable jobs, not the NAPCO thing they're talking about. So this academic figures doesn't add up anything. And but I'm the saying NAPCO that this, 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 uh, 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 this, this FDI they are talking about, even in 2015, mm. we, we, we had 3.2 billion. So adding 100 million is mediocre. And in any case, the, the 3.2 billion we, we did, is the result today you would get $1 billion from oil, that we have a gas infrastructure that is producing fuel to stop doing so. What has NPP done in the uh, two and a half years? Nothing. Nothing. Solar hydro is not a solution to the world. But see, the logic, the logic of okay. the fact I'm that grateful, gentlemen. projects Monday that have been is taking two years um, to finish is still an NDC project. Is a member of the I mean, it's NPP lost to me. Team, uh, <laughs> Honorable Kwame Agbojo, MP for Adapu, a member of the NDC. I'm grateful for your Monday morning. Thank we you can stay much. right here.